Oh, I've always wanted to do that. Hello, how are you going, everybody? Welcome here to everyone in the room here at Lanyon High School. And also thanks to all those who are joining us online on the Zoom. Welcome to Senator David Pocock's Tuggeranong Town Hall. I'm Sarah Reid. I was one of the volunteer coordinators on the campaign, and it was my great privilege to work with the hundreds of volunteers who wanted to see genuinely representative politics and politics done differently. And look what we did. It's great to uh, have Senator David Pocock in Parliament. Um, and so good to see some of the volunteers here also today and welcome to local residents. You might have seen some of us knocking on your doors, having a chat with us at the shops. Um, we might have had a chat while you waited on that long chilly line pre-poll at Lakeview House or maybe on election day at the local school. Um, volunteers, hope you're still getting use out of the t-shirts. Good to see a few of them on today. Uh, and it's important to know that that discussion that we were having during the campaign didn't end on election day. Today's town hall is about continuing that conversation and making sure that the community continues to be heard. I might also take this opportunity um, to plug for a community initiative that a few of us here are part of and building support for. Currently called Suburb Zero, it's a trial scheme to help householders reduce energy costs by switching to solar, battery, switching appliances and to electric vehicles, removing that barrier to entry by removing the upfront costs. Um, it'd be fantastic to see a suburb in Tuggeranong as Suburb Zero. And if anyone's interested today to find out more about what it is and, and how we're building support for it, come and have a chat to me. But now it is my very great honour to introduce Ngunnawal Elder, Auntie Violet Sheridan, who is kindly providing a welcome to country. Thank Thanks, you so much. What a pleasure is to be here. Thank you, and I welcome you to the traditional land of the Ngunnawal people. I'd like to acknowledge Senator Pocock, Aunty Pat, and all of you beautiful people here just as well. Uh, and I'd like to um, pay my respects to my elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect if there's other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people present in this, eve this afternoon. But I'd also like to acknowledge all you beautiful non-Indigenous people, people here as well, because we need to, keep, to work together uh, and in reconciliation. And I know you all know a voice to Parliament, so only Pat's going to talk a little bit about that later, but I'm going to say something as well. So keeping in the general spirit of friendship and reconciliation, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to, once again to the traditional land of the Ngunnawal people. This is my mother's country, and on behalf of my family and the other Ngunnawal families, I say welcome. Thank you. But before I go, I just want to talk a little bit about the referendum. So I have this feeling that our Prime Minister is going to go to the vote on the 27th of May next year, uh, the referendum of the 1967 uh, referendum, which back then I was about 12 year old. And before that, before we went to to the refer to the referendum in regards to, to count us in the census, I wasn't a citizen in my own country until they, till the ninety percent of Australians voted us to be included in the uh, constitution in the census. But I said to my dad back then, um, "What does this mean?" And he said, "Absolutely nothing. It just gives the government the power to more power to control our lives." So we need to work together. We're asking non-Indigenous people, please come and listen. On the 17th of October next month, I'm having a yarn up circle. Uh, so if you're um, familiar with Thomas Mayer uh, and along with Aunty Pat a, um, and Megan Davis have uh, are about delivering and talking about it. So if you're really, really interested, our We Aren't Up Circle will be at the University of Canberra on the 17th of next month, two sessions, one in the day for um, people to parents and people to come along and learn about uh, 10 o'clock about the, the referendum, but also one at six o'clock for people that work. So I haven't got a room yet, but I will have hopefully get information back to wh where it is, what room we're at. So please, you're all invited because we need to come together in reconciliation. We have a 
talk about the Uluru Statement of Art, talk about the voice to parliament, but also talk about us being included in the constitution. And we can't do this without the support of non-Indigenous people. Back in 1967, it was 90%. We're hoping we get more, 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 200%. So please come along and join us in and learn what, what it's all about because we need to walk both black and white into the future because I'm a great grandmother and I don't want them to be left out and, and be treated differently as everybody else. Thank you so much, God bless, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie Violet. Uh, now, before I introduce our next special guest speaker, Here's how David hopes to answer as many of your questions as possible. So what we'll do is we'll alternate between the Slido app, where I think a number of people have submitted questions already, and perhaps people online have, uh, and questions in the room. So the way we go to the Slido questions is the ones that have the most votes from everyone would be the ones we ask first. Uh, those questions are now closed. I can't ask any more questions, but you can still vote. So if there's a question on there and you think, oh, I really want David to answer that, um, we encourage you to vote for it. Uh, and that will bump them up in the queue. So we'll have people in the room with roving microphones as well, and they all watch for whose hands are up and go to the next person. So we'll swap between them. Uh, if David doesn't get to your question or you don't really want to ask it in front of everyone, um, we'll have POCOC staff and volunteers with the T-shirts, and you'll see a few of them around. They'll have waving their hands. They'll have a sheet with a QR code on it. Uh, so you can submit your question that way, and, um, and the office will endeavour to get back to you with an answer after today. Uh, but first, I'd like to welcome our very special guest speaker, Auntie Pat Anderson. Auntie Pat is an Aluara woman, an uh, officer of the Order of Australia, and until recently, the longtime chair of the Lewitcher Institute, Australia's National Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research. Auntie Pat is also the 2021 ACT Senior Australian of the Year and co-chair of the Referendum Council, where she played a lead role in facilitating the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart also won the Sydney Peace Prize in 21-22. Um, Auntie Pat's got a very, very long list of credentials and accolades and amazing work. Um, and today she's here to talk to us about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I encourage you to welcome Auntie Pat. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Violet, for yet again, a very generous um, welcome to country. And of course, you were going to say something mm -hmm. about the voice. Violet has been one of our staunchest and longest um, supporters of it. Um, I grew up in Darwin and I've been living in Canberra for the last, I don't know, 14 years. Uh, I came with my grandson. And he's now um, 19, but going on 30. As you know, boys seem to, going on 30, knows everything and is bulletproof, of course. Um, he talks about being in Canberra longer than he's been at home because Darwin, I think of Darwin still as their home. And he's no now, and I've been here longer than I've been in Canberra. Anyhow, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, Professor Megan Davis, Noel Pearson and myself were part of the very large referendum council um, set up by Malcolm Turnbull in 2016. Uh, Malcolm Turner and Bill Shorten. It was a bipartisan approach. I ended up co-chairing uh, this council when Patrick Dodson left to become a senator. Very briefly, um, the referendum, sorry, the referendum, I'm, I'm fixated on the referendum at the moment. Uh, anyhow, at the time, we were asked to go out, that was our terms of reference, and in a nutshell, um, talk to Aboriginal First Nations peoples about how they wanted to be recognised. Recognised is a difficult word, and it doesn't mean just I recognise you because I know you. It's got a legal implication. It's quite complicated, but it means being seen, being acknowledged, being accepted. So that's a very difficult word, but that's what it means. There were five terms of uh, reference that the Referendum Council had to take out, and each was discussed and debated in breakout groups. Megan Davis designed uh, what was called the deliberative education process. For, before I go any further, I really want to pay tribute to all of those people who turned out to a three-day meeting to talk about the Constitution. Uh, for some, often some of the discussion was about an abstract, um, was in abstract form, but people persevered and came out and sat there for three days. 
talking about referendum change, referendum change, constitutional change. <clears throat> there were 13 dialogues held around the country in different locations. At each location they were, it was expected that the host organization would include people from the, from the region. There was a formula, if you like, and it was very deliberate. 60% um, had to, people had to come from other TOs or custodians of the country there. And another 20% had to be come from the organizations uh, in the area. And the other 20% were people that perhaps didn't fit either of those two criteria with stolen generations or important, influential in their area. So that was the, that was the all of that. The reason we had 60% was to give the whole process of that dialogue some cultural authority. So people would be speaking from a, from a base um, with, uh, with, real, with real authority. So that's why it was structured that way. Um, we had about over 100 people at each dialogue, same agenda, same hours, same night. We had, you know, we had dinner and went exactly the same. Each of the five um, breakout groups, part of Megan's team, uh, constitutional lawyers were there as resource people, to, only to answer questions, not to direct the discussion. That was done another way because each group, we had seven people that were employed by the local organisation. Here in Canberra, we had a one day meeting because they were supposed to come to Sydney, but they didn't. We had two meetings in Sydney. So we had a bit of pressure to have it. So we had a one day meeting here, but nevertheless, they still elected seven people. Um, to go to, uh, to to the to the convention, so <clears throat> same same everything because we had to we were duty bound to um, we couldn't have a meeting like this because we wanted to have the any everybody who came to the meeting was able to talk. So we made some uh, decisions about that, like we didn't record and we didn't film because we wanted to leave it. People were comfortable enough to say what they wanted to say. Megan and I have done most of the talking with a small team over the last five years. The people who came to those regional dialogues were not people who were going to go on the drum. They're not going to go on Q and A, and they're certainly not going to write an, uh, an opinion piece. So we were duty bound to, and remain so, to take this to its nth, the very nth of this whole process, because of our commitment to the people that we gave um, at those uh, dialogues. The last, the last um, duty, I suppose, of each of the dialogues was to elect, the, the, each meeting chose to elect seven delegates to go to the Uluru Convention. So we stepped back. Oh, at all of the, the dialogues, Meg, it was run by local people, seven of them. Meg and I and Noel, we became presenters, presenters of information. That's all we did was to give people information. It was entirely up to them uh, what they decided in the end. So, um, so that's that's. I just want to make that that point clear because this is nothing to do. The decisions that were made were considered and debated and argued over for those seven those seven days. Um, so it's, it was a very uh, robust, in my view. It's never happened before in this country that we've been asked, for instance, by any government, what we might want. First time ever. So <clears throat> when we got to um, this was a, this was a well, I can't stress this was a very deliberative and carefully designed uh, process. Um, one of our main objectives was to allow an environment where all delegates, as I've just said, would feel comfortable enough to properly participate, not just the loudest voice, which is what you get in a town hall um, type meeting because the subject matter was too, was very complicated and it needed people to make informed decisions about just about everything. Professor Megan Davis, uh, my, myself and Noel Pearson and a very small group of dedicated people have been lobbying for the past five years, ever since we came back from Uluru, in fact, for the statement to be accepted and implemented. We set up a, um, a site, a web page, almost immediately we got off the plane when we came back from the area. Uh, the delegates at, Ver at Uluru were very deliberative and mindfully about the statement to the Australian people, to you. They decided to gift the statement to you. You, you have the power to change the constitution. All of us have the responsibility 
of deciding what kind of country we now have. What are our values? What do we stand for? There is a real opportunity here to, to reimagine what we could and should be, to reimagine. We don't have to do the same old, same old. A successful referendum on this issue of a voice to parliament for us is nation building. It will begin to finish the unfinished business between us all. It will lead to better decision making about us. It will lead to better government um, as well. It will allow us once and for all to take our rightful place in our own lands. This is our place. You're very welcome. You've been here a long time, but nevertheless, the bottom line is this is our country. And we want to share it with you. We have been sharing it with you, but you haven't heard us. You don't see us. We're invisible. In fact, same as Violet, you know, I, I was not a citizen um, for a long time. Um, I, um, anyhow, that's another story. All of us have stories like you. You all have stories as well. And I want to acknowledge you like Violet did for the work that you do in your families and your communities. And we are going to need you all now in particular. This is really important. So as much information as you can get over the next little while will be uh, really important. But the fact that you've come out on a Sunday afternoon to listen to me is, is just amazing. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for being here and having wanting to know more um, about this, price, this process. It's going to take a level of sophistication and um, maturity to have this conversation, this debate. It's going to get really nasty, um, very much like the, equal, the marriage equality um, bill. So be prepared, you know, stand your ground. In, you have to inform yourselves. It's going to be really important because, you know, when you get to the ballot box and you're going to write yes or no, it's really up to you. Um, so try to find out uh, as much as you can. You know, we have been doing this a really, really long time. Um, generation after generation after generation has had a go at saying, we're here, accept us, respect us. This is, our, this is our place and it's, it's never happened. Successive governments uh, have not heard us. We have been lobbying, take, talking to governments of all political persuasions for generations. The, this latest process now is, is 12 years old. It was started by Julia Gillard. Gillard. In about 10, 11 years, we had like eight select committees. This got, how much more talking about this do we need to do? For goodness sake. So, um, The voice of parliament, in fact, nothing's new. Everything that people, decisions they made in the regional dollars is not new. We've all said the same thing in various ways over generations. In fact, the voice to parliament is not new. It was William Cooper, a very famous activist in Victoria. It was William Cooper who, for a Yorta Yorta man, said in the 1920s, 30s, we need a voice to parliament so we can talk directly to the people because the parliament is the people, eh? Um, so... Um, so it's not nothing we said been saying. We just keep saying the same things uh, over, over and over again. So our shared history, we do have a shared history. It's just that we know a little bit more about you than you know about us because we've had to, to survive. We had to, you know. So, I, you know, on a more personal level, one of the challenges that I have, I am nervous about is that very fact. So that you don't know um, too much um, about us. We know, like I say, a lot about you. So it's really important um, that you um, inform yourself. I'm going to talk a little bit about now um, the sort of politics of this whole um, discussion. We have never ceded um, sovereignty. However, whatever action we take, the Commonwealth will remain the paramount legal authority. We're not challenging that. Even future treaties will be susceptible to parliament and could be torn up, leaving it living in the absence of a constitutionally protected voice, nothing. So if that happens, we don't have anything. Some refuse to accept this. Their solution should be understood in the context of their refusal to engage in these challenges in my view. That's a very personal view because there's a whole lot of information about that. Just dig a little bit deeper and try to find out uh, what's, what's happening there. The statement was developed through a process, as I've already explained to you, that understood these challenges. You know, we've been around a long time. We're not stupid. 
we know what's viable, what's probably going to work, and what absolutely isn't going to work. And there's a bit of a dichotomy. There's a bit of tension there. Do you go too low or do you go too high? But for the moment, what's on the table we think is a middle route, like a good Buddhist. It's the middle, it's the middle road. That's what we've got here. 13 regional dialogues ran over, as you oh, I told you about that. Now, these, um, these deliberations that we held around the, around the country countenance broad views from, it, from the Indigenous community, including dissent, um, a, lot of, a lot of arguments, uh, but it did lead to consensus at the convention in, in, 20, in 27. We believe that these reforms, as I've just said, uh, are credible and achievable. Um, the Uluru Statement changes, changes are, ground, are grounded in the legitimate rights of First Nations. We are also informed by the reality of the Australian state. We understand how the system works. We've been receiving the brunt of it uh, for generations. So we know, we know how it all works. <clears throat> this means delegates at the regional dialogues and the national con con uh, convention understood the difference between credible, achievable change as opposed to ideal, impossible constitutional amendments and reforms, each more impossible legally and, politi and politically to achieve than the last. There is one reason why the voice enshrined in the constitution was the first preference for change of regional and national delegates in the sequenced order of voice, treaty, truth. The sequence is important. The order of voice first, followed by a Makarata commission for agreement making and truth making was not forced on delegates. This cannot be dismissed as the preference of leadership. Rather, it was a result of informed deliberative dialogues where delegates wanted their voices to be heard and for that structural change to inform future processes of agreement making, which is now called treaty making and truth telling. You might notice in the um, Uluru, we don't use the word um, treaty. We've used the word makarata. Makarata means coming together after fight. Um, and up north where I come from, usually a fight means spearing. Someone would take a spear, but not fatal. Uh, and then once that done, that business is finished with, so we can all move on. We're a collective. So we can't have dissenters that so we have to find, we've always had to find ways so we can move forward in a, often in a harsh, a harsh environment. So we understand um, consensus and the, and the importance of the collective. I'm gonna talk a little bit about treaty now. The fact that the voice has been delivered, developed rather, through the most extensive process of constitution reform in Australian history. This process conducted over decades has canvassed all the issues many fixate on. The detailed work has been done where it is needed. This is a reform, this is structural reform, which is gonna make a difference, not tinkering around the edges of, we'll set up, you know, when you don't know what to do, you set up a committee, you know, you set a committee for this, a committee for that. This is going straight to the heart of where the decisions are really made for all of us. And we need to be at the table. You know, Australia is one of the few liberal democracies in the world that has, doesn't have any, any settlement or arrangements with its first peoples. The only liberal, well, one of the few, uh, not the only one, but it's only, it's one of the few. Most, most other countries that are commensurate with us, you know, in terms of where they sit in the world, you know, like Canada and America and even America, really. Uh, that's another story because, you know, but anyhow, they all have some arrangement, even the South American countries, they have some arrangement. We don't have anything. We just float, well, we been swinging in the breeze since, uh, you know, 233 years. This process kind of uh, canvassed all the issues, anyhow. These reforms, these are a couple of a few principles about that. There will be a voice because there should be. As I said, we're the only liberal democracy that doesn't have any, one of the few that doesn't have any arrangement. We have no, no say in all of the policies and decisions um, that are made, uh, made about us. Um, in my life, I mean, subject, um, my mother was a ward of the state under the superintendent of native welfare, as it was called in those days. We had, um, and I grew up um, under that system. Um, in the, in, I can remember my mother having a, this little book from the post office. It was a child endowment, it was called. A pre, it was a national, and Aboriginal women can get it as well. But the difference is with our mothers and grandmothers, 
they had to go to the superintendent of native welfare to ask if they could have their money. I remember my, my mother had five pounds. I remember these vouchers um, for five pounds and she'd have to explain to him how she was going to um, use, thank you, uh, use the money. And um, he would then decide whether she could get all of it or portion of it, depending um, on what she told him. And when I was leaving school, there was only one job available to me was to be a cleaner. Nothing wrong with it being a cleaner, but that was the only option that was available to me from where I, who I was and where I came from. So there will be a voice because there should be. We've been excluded from all of the decision-making that's been made about us for generations. It will provide advice to parliament because it should as a matter of right and best practice. I'll talk about advice in a minute, uh, although I'm running out of time. Parliament will have power over its, over its makeup and powers because that is how our constitutional system works. Um, if we aren't happy with the voice, we can organise to change it because the voice will be all the what people are calling meat on the bones, which is a bit of a furphy really, and I've run out of time to explain that to you. Um, but um, anyhow, there's too much to answer, there's too much to tell you. There are no easy answers, uh, but the voice is a mechanism for us to make real lasting change. The voice is fundamental existence as a matter of principle between First Nations and the Australian state would always remain. So the current system is not under threat in any way by giving us a voice to parliament. Former court, uh, high court judges are now saying, and have done uh, 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 Murray Gleeson and uh, French, they said, Kate came out very early in the piece to say there is no legal pediment to having a voice to parliament as set out in the Uluru statement. It's a political decision and ultimately your decision, of course. The voice would provide a permanence authority institution to negotiate the relationship between us and, and you. Finally, after 233 years, we'd be taking a substantive step towards First, First Nations. We would be recognized and respected and decisions would no longer be made without, without us. Not even a treaty can guarantee uh, that. But I have to finish here because um, Emma's winding me up. Uh, I'm, I'm getting round up by Fiona. I'm happy. I'm going to stay for a little while, guys, so if you want to add, I don't know, the questions. But anyhow, thank you all again very much for coming. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Emma. Thanks so much, Auntie Pat Sheridan. And we could have heard you for a lot longer. We did. Uh, so I'm looking at you, Auntie Violet, and I'm saying I'm sorry, Auntie Pat. Thank you so much for your patience and for your stamina. Um, and we hear your um, enthusiasm for us to inform ourselves. And I really think it is incumbent on all of us to learn more and to be able to celebrate a really good path forward. Um, thank you, Auntie Pat Sheridan. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry, you know, I'm going <laughs> to have to call you Auntie Violet Anderson. Aunt, no. Thanks, Auntie Pat Anderson. Um, one of the key promises that David Pocock made to the Canberra community is that he will be accountable to us. And David is here today to do just that. So he'll give us an update about what's happening in the Senate, his priorities, and then we'll open up for questions. So let me introduce the man we know as Dave, who probably still flinches at Senator, but protocol is what it is. Um, I'm not going to call you David Sheridan. <laughs> Senator David Pocock. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Auntie Violet, thank you for the welcome to country. I, I'd like to acknowledge we, we are on Ngunnawal country and pay respects to you and, and other Ngunnawal uh, elders, past and present, and to, to Auntie Pat and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here today. Sarah, thank you for everything you did in the campaign. Sarah is was the energizer bunny of, of the campaign, the uh, door knocking evangelist, and uh, added added so much. So thank you and, and thanks for, for emceeing tonight. There's been a lot going on uh, in the last few months. It's been a really steep learning curve. I'm really, really enjoying it learning a huge amount i've got i've got a great uh little team that is working incredibly hard 
for for the people of of the ACT. So I thought I'd run through a few of those things. Uh, the big one is obviously the climate bills. We had a lot of negotiations over the last uh, couple of months. And you know, whilst I'd said I'd ultimately vote for it, I was really pushing uh, Minister Bowen and his department to improve the bill. And I think in the end, getting four amendments that just that did exactly that. The big one was that they have to actually take into account the risks uh, that climate change pose and the risks of not acting. And then the three others were really around transparency and, and um, when the advice will be made made public. So we can actually both see the advice and then see the minister's um, decision and be able to compare the, compare the two. Another big one, which I know is really important to a number of Canberrans is aged care. Uh, the government's sort of split up a lot of the recommendations from the Royal Commission into separate bills. And the one at the moment that we've been negotiating on is the 24 seven registered nurse care, which is, I think a really important step forward. And uh, we've managed to get some amendments um, in there talking to the minister to ensure that, you know, all the people in our communities are actually getting good care and that there, there are, uh, safeguards in place uh, in terms of when um, certain aged care centres maybe regionally get exemptions that there's actually a time cap on that and that that, that then gets reviewed and so we're ensuring that regardless of where you live um, you're going to get good care but also taking into account you know challenges around uh, staffing. Uh, cashless debit card is another one so <laughs> a really big um, issue that's been dragging on for, for a long time now. Uh, compulsory income management has to go. And so uh, I've been working, um, it's, it's, it's not working. And uh, clearly the challenge now is, is how do we best uh, transition people off compulsory income management while recognizing that there are some communities that ha have established really effective ways of, of actually having a voluntary income management scheme and as a community decide who will go on it and it's usually just for a year or so uh, so there, there is some complexity there that we're working through and we want to ensure that communities who are doing that still have access to the technology that is available through the cashless debit card. So you've got the basics card and the cashless debit card, the basics card, like the name is very basic and, and is essentially administered by the government. Whereas the cashless debit card is, is a sort of tap and go type service where you can block um, certain uh, outlets and potentially certain products going forward. So uh, I've learned a lot um, about it and the team's been working hard on that. So hopefully we'll get some good outcomes. We're due to meet the minister again uh, this week, I guess, when, when, they, when they're back in town. On top of that, we've obviously been uh, replying to phone calls and emails about a range of uh, issues. Uh, we've set up uh, policy working groups on climate and environment and housing and immigration groups are in the works uh, in terms of setting them up. We've also had roundtables on the 10 days uh, paid family and domestic violence leave and also on electrification, which Sarah is uh, driving. So if you do want more info on that, um, chat to Sarah or Tom who's along there. Um, what else has been? One of the, yeah, one, so one of the other things that we've started talking about is recognizing that Canberra has been dudded in terms of infrastructure funding over the last five years. Like just any way you look at it, we haven't been getting 
enough. And I think you drive around Canberra and that's, it's pretty telling everything from community sports uh, infrastructure to our convention center where we can no longer really hold big, uh, big conventions. We've got the ANU taking uh, conventions to Sydney makes no sense for, for the nation's capital. So we've started, I guess, talking to uh, the relevant ministers about a Canberra city deal. Every other state and territory has at least one city deal. The ACT has never had one. I think that would make sense to actually try and get in uh, a big chunk of federal money to obviously then be um, matched with territory money and then some some private investment to actually start to address this this underinvestment across the the territory i've met with the treasurer and the housing minister and i'm <laughs> pestering them about our social housing debt uh, the act inherited 100 million dollars uh, of social housing debt over the next decade we'll spend 33 million dollars just repaying interest given we're at the forefront of this housing crisis, we're the most expensive city to rent in, the second most expensive to buy. It makes no sense that given the government is talking about addressing social and affordable housing, that we're gonna fork out that much money. So I'll keep pushing them on that. Um, not super open to it at the moment, but we'll, uh, we'll see as time, <laughs> as time goes on. Um, territory rights is, in the Senate, it's um, because it's a private senator's bill. I, did, I didn't know any of this stuff a few months ago. Uh, it only gets debated in uh, very sort of small allocations of time around private senator's bills and allocations of general business. And so it had its first uh, crack when it was introduced and then really there was no other time for it. So it just sits there. And so the last sitting week, I gave up my hour of um, opportunity to introduce a bill. I just said, let's just talk territory rights. And I'm currently work negotiating with the government and the opposition to add a bit more time to actually have a debate. It's, it's a conscience vote for both um, major parties. So they want anyone who wants to speak to it, to speak to it. So. We could have, I don't know, I think on the list there's about 10, 10 or so speakers left. So a, good, a solid few hours. So I'll, I'll keep pushing that. I'm really keen to bring it to a vote as soon as possible. I think the numbers are there. The longer we leave it, I think the more lobbying that will happen. And clearly it's time after 25 years. You know, the original bill, when it was introduced, the the thinking was that they wanted to keep the territories in line with the states. Now every state has legislated for interest to dying. So yeah, um, my uh, thinking is that the bill is now redundant. Um, so we'll keep you updated on that in terms of when it can can get uh, get debated. Um, those are the main things. Uh, probably better off going into questions because I know there's there's a few quite a few on Slido and no doubt a few from the floor so how do we want to go first to Slido let's do the Slido first so first one yeah um, and let us know again online if you can't hear us but first one is David would you support repealing stage three tax cuts this is something we get a lot of calls and emails about Clearly, given where we're at, we hear so much about the trillion dollars of debt, and we're also facing some massive challenges. It makes no sense to me to give $243 billion to mostly wealthier Australians and mostly men, if you actually, if you actually cut it down and look at who's going to benefit. I'm, you know, the government's been very clear they're not going to repeal it. I'm suggesting to them a redesign to actually make that a bit a lot more equitable, but also probably change it to actually deal with some of the big change, the challenges we face around uh, electrification, building infrastructure for, for the future, actually helping households, not just save money with a fuel excise cut for six months, but every single year be saving thousands of dollars 
by ensuring that low income households can actually move to electric appliances, can install heat pumps, have solar on the roof. It's a, it's a massive opportunity for us. This is something we know is gonna happen over the next decade or so. The economics will, will be there. Our opportunity is to bring that forward and really start to address some of the cost of living crisis uh, that we're facing around the country. I've met with the, the treasurer and put forward my views and, and will continue to really uh, agitate and, and advocate on this because it's clearly important to to people in in the ACT um, I'm sure you know <laughs> as someone who is on a politician's salary uh, there's many people who would love an extra eight or nine thousand dollars in their pocket every year but it just doesn't make sense um, we can we can use that money to build a better future we can use that money to actually deal with the big challenges we face so that's that's um, my views on that. You know, breaking it, looking looking at that that tax cut. Australia's richest one percent will save as much as the poorest sixty five percent combined. Um, so, you know, even Jackie Lambie, who voted for the tax cut, is now saying that uh, it shouldn't happen. So there, there's the numbers there. If the government uh, did want to change them or, or abolish them, but that's you know, that's their political calculation now. And given it, I think they come in a few six months before the next election. Um, could be a very tough thing to to sell. Let's we go to the. So, with the Roby wipes, if you want to go to the person nearest you, we've got we've got one over here. Question over here. Hi, David. Um, my name is Vicky, and I live in Gordon, uh, born and bred Canberran. So, been here for a long time. Um, my question's around healthcare. Um, basically, seeing Canberra go from bad to worse uh, with closure of Canberra Hospital. Um, nobody really wanted the closure of Canberra Hospital except government. Um, and the bulk billing rates, the whole basically health system in Canberra and access to um, affordable, timely health service is very poor. Canberra Hospital now waiting times are ridiculous. Just wondering what your view is on that whole space and where you might be able to make a difference or advocate for better bulk billing. Mm -hmm. I know there's federal issues versus mm -hmm. ACT government, mm -hmm. but in both arenas, a lot more needs to be done. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, big Big challenge again. We hear we we hear a lot about this in the office, and it is something that is sort of mostly territory. But there's obviously the, a big federal component of this. Now, I think firstly is funding. You look at the ACT and the um, sort of underestimation of our population. We've been getting less money than we should have. But also I think we've got to really push the government to recognize that we're a regional hub. It's not just 430,000 Canberrans. We're, we're servicing a region of you know, a million people uh, within an hour and a half. And I'd really like to see investment into our healthcare system that recognizes that, that people are actually coming to Canberra for, for healthcare. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that the, the delivery is up to the territory government um so you know i think we need to be pushing pushing them on it but things like bulk billing massive challenges there like the, the bulk billing rate I think we've got one of the lowest in the country and clearly the the gap there is not working for us you know seeing more and more um people just not going to the doctor because they can't can't afford to and obviously that is affecting um, low income households more and women more than any other group. So something, you know, federally, we've got to be looking at the, the system in terms of um, rebates and how we're actually uh, delivering healthcare in Australia. I'm hoping that once the government gets through these early sort of wins that they want to get in terms of policy, that we can start to really push them on, on the, the bigger um, reform around this because 
the, the way it's trending, I think is, is really worrying for, for a lot of Australians. I don't have any sort of solutions for you at the moment, sorry. Questions on the screen. Do you have any plans to end indefinite detention of asylum seekers? Half spend over two years of detention. Some have been in detention for five years and counting. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I think no one would say that we have a humane or fair approach. We clearly have to balance, um, you know, national security and being an island with just actually caring about people who desperately need um, support and actually just trying to you know, find a better life. I think the average length of immigration detention is 700 days in Australia. Uh, in Canada, it's 24. In the US, it's 43. and the UK, it's 29. We clearly have a problem. Uh, and like, there's an expectation in the community that we, we deal with this now. I've met with Minister Giles and really sort of pressed him on this. Um, they have said that they're, they're, they're working on it. They're trying to really sort of add to the workforce to be able to process um, things quicker. But clearly, you know, this is, this is not good enough. Um, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that it will change soon in terms of people are in there at the moment, but then also being more proactive and actually setting up a system that is more efficient and will ultimately cost a lot less money. You know, the way we've set it up is, is, um, is frighteningly ex expensive and I, I think totally unnecessary. So there's, 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 there's hopefully gonna be some news out of the minister's office on this. Um, we'll keep you know, pushing him behind, behind the scenes. We're writing pretty regular um, letters about various cases and you know, really appreciate there's a number of people in the community who've put their hand up to actually be part of a, a group that will, will help coordinate that and I think you know can, can really keep the pressure on um, the minister um, to the floor. Uh, hi, uh, Senator Pocock. Um, so I'm an emergency healthcare provider in Canberra, and I just wanted to take an insider's perspective on the issues that we've been having in the healthcare system, which I feel like have a deeper root problem in uh, vulnerable people who've been failed by the system who aren't being supported by the government. So it's no secret that Canberra has a huge homelessness problem. A lot of these people are ex-felons, ex-convicts who aren't supported after they've been released. Do you support this infrastructure funding that we're hoping to get going towards um, not only public housing, but also helping people get training and get jobs and seek out health care that is specific to uh, psychiatric issues that they may be facing in order to help these people rise above where they've been pushed down to by these systems that have failed them and take pressure off of healthcare providers who are basically the only people who they can go to for a place to sleep, some food to eat, and someone to listen to their issues. I want, to, I want to say yes, but the, the way the government is suggesting they're going to invest in social and affordable housing is to set up a um, fund that will then invest in, they say, 30,000 social and affordable houses over the next five years. My, to my, my understanding is it has nothing um, sort of related to, to what you're talking about, but this is clearly a huge problem and, and something that we should be dealing with. I've been calling for job seeker to be raised to something that's actually livable. Uh, a lot of people who are trying to find their feet uh, sh shouldn't have to live in poverty. For a wealthy country like Australia, it's something that we should should be doing. And it, you know, it's clear you look at any, any of the studies show that it is much better for all of us to actually have people living above the poverty line, able to get back into the workforce 
And we saw during COVID when JobSeeker was raised, it raised thousands of Australians out of poverty, but we've put them back into, into poverty and, and apparently can't find the money for that despite $243 billion of tax cuts, $11 billion of um, fossil fuel subsidies in the budget, how many billion dollars of, of Barnaby's dams. Uh, so it really is about priorities. I'd, I'd love to hear more if you do have ideas of, of how to do that. I appreciate you've got a, a really unique uh, perspective. So we'd, we'd love to chat a bit later. Thank you. Thank you. And I might just say, um, we did mention that this session would go till four, uh, but there are loads of questions. So Dave's are happy to stay and answer. So we completely understand if you need to leave at four, um, but if you're happy to stay, uh, Dave's happy to keep going for a little bit. So the next question on Slido is about uh, media concentration. So the concentration of press ownership, the lack of any real requirement for media to be factual or balanced is an issue for all democracies. How do we fix it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly having an informed public is crucial to a functioning democracy and having a diversity of, in our media is important. You look at what a bunch of the Nordic countries have done. They've got an incredibly diverse media landscape. They really incentivize and support uh, smaller newspapers, community-run newspapers. In Australia, we've seen the exact opposite, which is increasing concentration. And it's very hard to argue that that's, that's a good thing for, for Australia. Um, sorry. Yeah, some, some, some would say. <laughs> uh, you know, half a million Australians called for a, a Royal Commission into this to get that up you obviously need the the numbers you'd, you'd need one of the the major parties i suspect almost everyone on the cross bench would um would probably support it uh, but i think at the end of the day this does come down to the major parties how do, how do we force them to actually take this seriously it's it's a it's a very inconvenient problem um, I don't think either of them want to want to take it on and really telling that so I think as soon as prime ministers get out of politics they seem to jump on the <laughs> on the bandwagon but when when they're the PM it's a it's a very hard thing to, to take on the media given it is so concentrated now so as far as what I can do um, I'm not sure I don't think I'd have the numbers to do anything in the Senate. I know Zoe uh, Daniel is um, introducing, is it, a, is it a motion for a Zoe Daniels? Okay, so have another committee. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, good good funding for 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 a public broad, broadcaster, I, I think is important. And sorry, <laughs> proving the board. You know, polit political appointments to boards is is something that I've been raising with with the you know relevant ministers because we're seeing this across across government. And again, the challenge is is how do we actually get good systems in place that regardless of who the government is, it's transparent because it's become apparent to me that one of the, the challenges is, is that both the major parties know that at some point they'll be in government. And so there, there is a reluctance to really uh, change things and actually have independent processes. Um, you know, I think an example is with this integrity commission the crossbench has been saying that it shouldn't, uh, the, the, the joint committee that oversees the integrity commission shouldn't be government dominated. It should sort of be held by the, the, the balance should be held by the, the crossbench and their response is that's unprecedented. 
<laughs> and my response is an integrity commission is unprecedented so let's do both so you know we'll, we'll keep we'll keep pushing pushing them on that and I, I you know i think as the major parties see more and more independence being backed by their communities i think the more and more we're going to see these sorts of ideas become more palatable Thanks, Dave. And next question on the floor over here. Hi. Hi, my name is Ines, and you are a breath of fresh air. You are the only person okay. that would make me drop my gardening gloves to be here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank so you. I want to ask you, there is that committee or something to do with long COVID. Uh -huh. Who are they and what are they going to do? Do you know something that got instituted recently? I'm not actually yeah, sure. Like to they be were honest. talking this weekend and I haven't been able to get information. Let me, Rory. Okay. I wanted to say that if you need any help, I am working with a group in La Trobe studying long COVID. Okay. So I am happy to give you help if you need anything. Thank you very much. So if I could I'm, leave my name with we'd love to get people. We'll take your details. And I, I'm sure they'll probably be taking submissions. So that could be a great opportunity to actually um, put in a submission to that. Thank you. And next question is from Catherine Blunt. Will you support Andrew Wilkie's bill, the ending indefinite and arbitrary immigration detention bill? This would end offshore immigration detention. Andrew's obviously been a, a champion of this for a long time now and really pushing it. Whilst you know, I haven't seen the details of the bill, but in, in, in principle, I'd support it. Uh, it's certainly not going to get to the Senate. So, um, you know, unfortunately not something that I'll be able to, uh, to consider and, and support, but I think we certainly need more voices actually pushing for a fairer, more humane way to, to deal with people seeking asylum. Next question. Thank you. I just want to know though, what your views are on racist groups here in Australia, like the Nazi party and the skinheads and all that, is the government um, going to make those illegal? Because I'm mean, just thinking about, you know, my people, but I'm th thinking about the Jews, uh, other um, cultures here in, the, in Australia. So I think, and these uh, groups can be very dangerous. Mm. So I was thinking, what is your thoughts or, uh, and the government's thoughts on that? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually sure what, what is being done or what the new government's approach is to that. But clearly we, you know, we look around the world and there's a lot of instability and, and you know, the war in Ukraine. But we know that the greatest threat to Australia is homegrown terrorism. And we, I think we have to take that seriously, both in terms of building a fairer country, um, more inclusive communities that, that don't, um, I guess, allow as much um, isolation and, and people to, to feel like they're disenfranchised and they, they need to go down that pathway. But then also really taking it seriously the groups that are that are doing that I, I know that there's a number of people in um government agencies working on that but certainly something i can try and get a brief on and and speak to um speak to the minister minister about uh-huh I'm not saying they did it, but that's something really important that we need to look at. Okay. 
I can, we can ask be home affairs. Yeah. Yeah. We can try and get a briefing on that. Something like that. Thanks. And next question from Matt Denning. Should tax exemptions apply to religious organisations for their activities outside a recognised charitable purpose? Um. <laughs> Sorry, this is something I actually had to <laughs> read a bit about. You know, having um, started and run a, a, a charitable organisation, th there is a lot of paperwork and a lot of hoops to jump through. And you know, my understanding is that religious organisations actually have to be registered as a um, charity in order to have um, tax exemptions. Whether or not religious organisations should be singled out, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd be open to, you know, people putting their, their case forward. I do know that a whole bunch of charities far too much money gets chewed up in administration and all sorts of other things rather than actually what they're set up to do. I don't think that's um, specific to Australia either. I think, you know, around the world, there's a, there's a bit of a, a trend. So I'm not sure. I, I, I recognize that you know, there are, there are a bunch of religious organizations that, do actually contribute in a really meaningful, meaningfully full way to communities around the country. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be very happy to have more of a discussion about it. But uh, as it stands, I'd probably say that I wouldn't be sick. Yeah. Oh, honey, Pat. <laughs> Uh, before you go on pat sorry I, I wanted to say I, I wanted to say at the end thank you so much for your leadership your your tireless advocacy you know, i know the last you know decades but i think in particular the last five years after doing this incredible thing and doing what had never been done before in australia getting such consensus and providing australians with such a generous offer to then just have it sort of batted away um i can't imagine how tough the last five years are so i'm, I'm really excited about the next however long until this referendum and, and really working working together to hopefully get it across the line thank you david thank you, thank you. okay and next question from the floor so hands up Do I press the button? No. Um, actually, the next one on the board is my question, but I'll ask the other one that I said. What do you think the population of the ACT should be going forward, and how can we protect the open space? Cool. I don't, I don't have a an informed view on a number, to be honest but I'm really passionate about ensuring that we protect habitat in, in the ACT. It's, I think it's an incredible place to live, but we've also got some huge challenges dealing with increases in, in population, but also you know, wanting to and needing to protect good habitat for a whole range of uh, species. So, yeah, I, I, I don't. So I don't have an. I don't have a number in terms of, of population. You know, the, the government has that sort of seventy thirty in full uh, new new suburbs. But at what point do we run out of land, and what sort of habitat are we we bulldozing to to build new suburbs? It's a really tough 
really tough conversations to be had. Uh, you know, particularly when there's so many people, you know, wanting, needing, needing, needing a home. Mm. Thanks. Okay, next question's uh, on the Slido um, from Chris. Could you please provide an update on the progress of the Integrity Commission legislation and will you consider ensuring it's retrospective? Sure. So early on, we had a couple of roundtables with the Attorney General and to, to his credit, he, he reached out early. We've basically just seen the design principles, which are really sound. Frustrating to not have seen a, an exposure draft yet. It was, it was obviously meant to have been released this last week. It, it has to be retrospective. Um, it's one of, one of the absolute uh, keys and, and something that will continue to, to press the government on. They obviously don't need any support in the lower house, but when it comes to the Senate, they will need support of the crossbench. And there are a number of things that we've been talking to the government about. Obviously, being retrospective, being able to investigate third parties. You know, we know that so much of so much corruption actually stems from outside of government. It's it's third parties, uh, whether it's you know, just people involved in in business or unions or property developers or whatever it might be, we have to be able to investigate them. Another thing is around ensuring that it has adequate funding and that that can't just be arbitrarily cut by a government that doesn't like what it's doing. Um, and then the, the, the next one is whistleblower protection. You know, I think obviously of increased importance to people in the ACT we have to ensure that people who actually blow the whistle on corruption are looked after. And you, know, you look at the, the case with Richard Boyle, someone who in his mind did everything he should have done to disclose information and is still getting prosecuted. So something we're, we're, we're pushing hard on. I'm not, I'm not sure if there will be specific whistleblower protection in this bill. The Attorney General is saying that um, he's potentially going to update the, um, the PID, the Public Interest Disclosures Act. Yes, uh, but they clearly have to be able to talk talk to each other. So I think things are looking good, but we'll have to wait and see what they what they introduce, but we'll continue to have have conversations um, behind the scenes and really push them on it. We clearly have to get this right. We need a really robust integrity commission that as a start can begin to build a, you know, a bit of trust uh, in politics and people can actually know that if there is corruption, it, it can and will be dealt with. Thank you. And a question on the floor. Um, there's a gentleman over here in the orange jumper. Thank you. Uh, my name's Graham Barnes. I live in Fadden and um, I'm president of the Pines Tennis Club in Chisholm. And the issues you've been talking about are quite significant. Um, there's no doubt about that. Mine's more of a local tuggernaut uh, <coughs> issue and you touched on lack of infrastructure funding. And my question really is about how do we get um, Commonwealth support? What's the pathway forward for sort of um, supporting community sport in the Tuggeranong Valley? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, we found that we're one of only two or three uh, community tennis clubs in the whole of the Tuggeranong Valley. And tennis is expanding at our club. We've got um, community bookings for our courts. We've got uh, a membership. We've got a, a huge coaching program. And uh, what what sort of support is available for us to um, expand our, our club, um, or even in the future to 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 um, help maintain our facilities? Mm -hmm. And I have with me Kim Paschal from Tennis ACT. Um, you might like to add a few words to that. 
Yeah, thanks, Ray. I was just going to say, um, tennis ACT, but also community sport ACT. And um, thanks, David. You've been shining a light on community sport and the infrastructure debt. Um, I think it's just a, a huge opportunity. Um, the return on investment, not only from the physical well-being, the mental health side of things, the social dividends, the social connection. Uh, it fits in the ACT wellbeing indicators. Um, and David Smith, MP, uh, recently had a sports forum. It was quite alarming. Um, the need for infrastructure to be upgraded for female toilets, disability access, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we, we feel that community sport can play a bigger role um, far beyond just the sporting boundaries and um, was keen on top of Graham's question to ask around that Canberra City um, deal that you spoke about. How, how can we best progress that or, or what, what are the, the next steps? Um, education as well, kids are not participating in sport um, in school as they should be um, and improves their NAPLAN scores and the like. Uh, and then the social, um, sorry, the sustainability piece, um, getting community sport geared up for climate change uh, mm -hmm. and, and so we can keep participating into the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I may, I may be biased given my background, but I just, I, I believe that, you know, every kid should have the opportunity to play sport should they want to. You it should be accessible and affordable. And we have to ensure that we're actually investing in infrastructure that is accessible and that kids aren't having to ask their parents to drive them halfway across town to, to, to play sport. And you know, that is a responsibility of the government to be investing in that, to actually have a plan for how that's going to happen you obviously can't invest in everything at once and i guess as a canberran it's really disappointing not for there not to be a, a plan that exists at the moment um certainly something that we're 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 pushing to have happen and, and will hopefully help facilitate that to answer your question about grants uh, i met for the, with the minister for sport there's currently no grants available uh, we're not a regional area so we miss out on on regional grants, but I think that there's a really strong case in terms of mental health and well-being for the for the government to actually begin to to invest in in these areas. Now, yesterday I was at the opening of the dome, which is four four bas indoor basketball courts and some football four fo football uh, futsal courts, and that's just a couple, Andrew and Fiona Hannon, who've put in a million bucks to open a facility that's been closed for the last five years. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that we're having to see that sort of thing happen. So yeah, there's currently no grants, but something I'm going to keep, keep pushing, keep talking to the, to the minister about, keep talking to the, the territory government about, and in terms of the city deal, we'd love to chat more. Uh, we're going to, Put together a bit of a working group around that um and it really helps uh the minister the relevant minister is, is um christy mcbain who's just across the border um and then mr king which I'm trying to think which king anyway we'll 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 uh we'll be involving both of them and yeah really trying to get a whole bunch of people in Canberra advocating for the for the same thing and tying in a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of infrastructure. But yeah, th thanks for the the work you're doing in that space. I yeah, it, I know it's a it's a hard slog at the moment. Okay, online question for you next. Um, hey Dave, uh, do you support increased subsidies for electric vehicles? Actually, sorry, I've EVs. misrepresented that. It's to make electric vehicles more affordable. This is a this is a massive challenge. You know, there's huge cost savings to be had if you can afford an electric vehicle, but the upfront cost is is big. Over the life of the vehicle, they're they're now cheaper, but that that still doesn't help you get over the upfront cost. And so it's it's crucial that we're actually looking at ways to um, help people buy electric vehicles. And one of those ways is through cheaper finance. 
And so we're, we're busy talking to government about ways for something like Arena to be uh, offering cheaper finance, you know, two and a half percent finance for, for electric vehicles. At the moment, there is a bill around fringe benefits tax and electric vehicles is coming through, but that's very much fleet vehicles. There are you know, other, other jurisdictions, including here in the ACT, are, are giving interest-free loans or, or rebates to try and lower that cost. Talking to experts, there's sort of mixed feelings about, um, about rebates, but I think it's, it's you know, clearly something that, again, over the next decade, it's going to be cheaper, but how do we bring that forward and help people actually deal with the cost of living crisis by not having to spend a hundred dollars a week at Ampol to to fill up it's a it's a huge opportunity for us um it's tied into that one of the other things we get quite a bit of um e quite a few emails about is active mobility how do we do the same thing for e-bikes uh be invest in our infrastructures that people can actually ride in ride into work more um i know there's mixed reviews on the scooters around town but it's uh <laughs> it does seem like a lot of people are using them um mainly drunk uni students at 11 p.m but um uh, they're certainly being used thanks dave and look we'll do a couple more questions from the floor perhaps one last on slido um i'll defer to our My name is Dan Everink. What's up? My name is Dan Everink, and, and my question follows very nicely from the previous question. Um, I congratulate you on your support for electrical, electric vehicles and the like. Um, I've had a plug-in hybrid for uh, eight years, and I had the pleasure of being driven here in a totally electric vehicle today which is a first time for me. Um, Alan Finkel, the chief scientist, uh, stressed the need to use every renewable energy source that we could possibly have. And the focus has been on wind and solar. Um, many people are not aware of the fact that we have enormous tides uh, around Australia and particularly in the Kimberleys. And, uh, Estimate has been there's 300 gigawatts of power there, um, which is not being used and has not been used, but it's still there. And um, a, a nice uh, um, phrase, it's time to turn the tide on climate change. Thanks, Mr. Etherington. So for those of you who, who don't know, um, Sutherington is an incredible uh, pioneer in the uh, coconut oil space. For decades has worked with villages and actually creating technology that allows them to process coconuts at a village level and capture a lot more of the, the income and has now in his... Uh, <laughs> In his in his youth, has turned his uh, his his mind to actually trying to create solutions around tidal energy, and is is making some real headway in there. So thank you for your work in that space. We're going to need all sorts of solutions, and I think clearly the stuff you're working on is so has so many applications to off the grid and and remote places. And Australia has such an opportunity in this space to be backing innovation like yours to be manufacturing that sort of stuff here and then exporting it to the world the whole world is going to be having this transition talking to you know a bunch of the experts the thing they're saying is whoever does it first wins <laughs> because if you can if you can develop the technology, develop the intellectual property, the rest of the world's going to want it over the next decade or two. So it's a massive opportunity, and thank you for thank you for the work that you're doing. It's really exciting. 
Uh, and now we've got one last question from the Slido. So we have two equal candidates on eight votes each. So I'm going to play Slido God and um, ask the second one. What role can you play in speeding up the adoption of electric public transport in Canberra? Brisbane has trackless trams. We could extend the ACT network faster. Well, you can't have a public meeting without the light rail coming up, so. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I think this is a really big issue for Canberrans, stage two light rail. Stage one has, has obviously worked really well, um, but, you know, there were no there were no bridges. There was no NCA to deal with, um, and I think this is something that we really have to look at. Some of some of the new technology, like electric trackless trams, that don't actually require the 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 tracks to be laid and the overhead wires, are now a reality around the world. You're seeing cities start to trial electric electric autonomous buses. There's all these solutions coming online and you, know, you look at the, the timeline for stage two, you know, potentially into 2030s and the cost. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not my role as a, as, as a senator, but you know, the federal government will be chipping in money. So I'm, I'm really keen to see this conversation actually happen and to ensure that we're getting systems that work for us that are not going to break the bank and that can potentially be rolled out much, much faster. And, and clearly there's some new options on the table now. So no doubt this is going to really flare up over the next however long. Uh, um, and I, yeah, I really welcome that, that, that public discussion. I think it's, it's really important that we are as a growing city, we're in, investing in ways to actually ensure that people can get around on public transport and it doesn't take an hour to get uh, 10, 15 Ks down the road that, it, that is accessible and, and affordable. So really good question. I'm disappointed the little eagle, eagle one didn't come up. Um, there was one about little eagle. Yeah, actually, I, I actually went to a, I'm going to answer anyway, because I said, <laughs> <laughs> ACT Parks had a day of, uh, I guess they all got together and they're presenting some research. And one of the little presentations was on little little eagles, and they're not doing well. Like there's there's a there's a lot of uh, work to be done there. And I think one of the things it really highlights is how important it is that we're looking after biodiversity and and habitat here in the ACT, but also that because they migrate, we've got to be pushing for better environmental laws that will ultimately ensure that that's enforced across the country. Because something like, um, is that me? No. Little eagles, they're nesting here, but then they're heading off and they'd tagged a bunch of them. And I, I think only one had survived beyond 12 months. So uh, clearly there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. And I really, you know, we're such a wealthy, relatively wealthy country. We can find the money to actually look after our, our natural heritage to ensure that future generations get to enjoy it um, as we have. So, sorry, that was a, just, a, I got excited when I saw that question. Good call, good call. <laughs> um, while I would get you to put your hand up for the last question on the floor. And look, thanks very much for, for staying a bit longer. A um, couple of things. If David hasn't got to your question today, please go to team members um, who can take your question with the QR code. Uh, and before we all finish up, I will just remind you, if you're getting hungry, to go and grab a sausage uh, and support the local scouts. But for now, our last question. Um, congratulations on being elected. Um, I think you're the first parliamentarian I've ever... Oh, sorry, get closer. I think you're the first parliamentarian I've ever seen down in the Valley apart from lead up to election campaigns, which is a good, that's a winner in my life to start with. <laughs> um, my two boys go to Lanyon High. This is their school. Um, I'm on the PNC. Um, we're 
I'm a big supporter of public education. And you'll see our oval out the back is unusable for mm. kids and being your background, that's probably not a good thing. Um, and the successive governments haven't funded public education particularly well. Um, what's your views on, on increasing that? And just as a sideline as well, um, we went up on Friday night to watch the Raiders unfortunately go down at Combank Stadium. Incredible stadium. We need something like that. I know it's a territory thing, but if we can work with Andrew Barr, we really need something like that here as well. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, education, school education really didn't feature in the election campaign much at all. And there's clearly a lot to do in, in all of it, you know, from early childhood, school, high school, and also tertiary is obviously crying out for reform. So I, I don't know what the government has, has planned. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to take it up with the, with the minister and find, find out. But yeah, it doesn't make sense not to have an oval that's, that's playable. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not my. Yeah, it's a cherished thing, but I'm happy to. I'm happy to send a letter to to the minister. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate you coming down on a on a Sunday afternoon. I'll be hanging around if you if you do want to chat. Um, but do you want to? Uh, look, I can only echo David's words there. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Really appreciate your time here. Thank you to everybody online. Fantastic questions. Uh, and look, let's keep the community engagement going on. Politicians uh, lead, but they're also led by us. So let's keep talking and keep asking. Asking the hard questions. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.